there is a lot of conjecture about the Lucy Levy case online. This video aims to cut through the subjective opinions and seeks to prove statistically what we can and can't know objectively from the publicly available information. This video is based on three main sources. Firstly, a sizeable statistical report produced by the Royal Statistical Society aimed squarely at how we should consider the stats around clusters of medical deaths in court cases. Note that this report was issued in September 22, one month before Lucy Letby's trial began, and was sent directly to both the prosecution and the defence. However, there's little evidence that the trial took any notice of this report, despite its lofty authors. I think this might be because this report comes across almost as if it were designed to put off anyone from letting statisticians get anywhere near court cases. It's overly wordy, full of incomprehensible figures, pages of computer code, and has a summary which pops up randomly in the middle of the paper, and to me doesn't even seem to align to the detailed text. Personally, I'm worried that this paper itself could well have led to a material downgrade in the statistical rigour with which Letby's case was tried. It does, however, point the way to setting your hypotheses up front, not biasing your data and performing statistical tests, in particular the chi-squared test on your data. So I've tried to use those rigorous methods to test the data publicly available to me. The next source is a series of reports issued by the Mothers and Babies Reducing Risk Through Audits and Confidential Inquiries Across the UK Task Force, entitled Perinatal Mortality Surveillance Reports. These are available from 2014 onwards. Now, it would be very helpful to see the data prior to 2014, but what we have is invaluable. For 2014 to 2017, they include details at every hospital in the country, but this detailed data is unfortunately dropped from 2018 onwards. Next is a series of freedom of information requests made by a person called Wally Aslam, which were responded to by the Countess of Chester Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and shared online. Link in the notes to this video. This is an excellent source of information, so thanks to Mr Aslam and the Trust. These have monthly data on births and deaths at the hospital. There are other more subjective data items included in the freedom of information request that I've not considered in this analysis. There are various data items I'd like to include in this analysis, but the police have not made publicly available many of the key pieces of evidence relied upon to convict Letby. So, no access to the infamous nurse rota baby death spreadsheet, no access to the fevered scribbles in the notebook, the falsified medical records, or the cryptic writing in another notebook. Anyway, let's dive into Mr. Aslan's Freedom of Information request data. Note when considering all this data that Lucy Letby worked in the neonatal unit from spring Let's call it May 2015 until July 2016. Firstly, burst by month. These seem to run at about 250 a month. They have a little up and down noise in the data. Note that noise is a very important concept in statistics. The world is uncertain. Things don't always come in as expected. And over centuries, a number of tests have been devised to check whether volatility observed is due to noise or something else. Noise can also be misleading. Patterns become apparent in random data. You can toss five heads in a row, but yet not be using a biased coin or cheating in some way. Humans have a particularly keen evolutionary desire to spot trends, to align cause to effect. That one time a deer rushed out of a forest, and then moments later so did a saber-toothed tiger, will lead to us forever getting ready to defend ourselves against a tiger when we see a deer. This makes sense on an evolutionary basis, as we're more protected from that danger source in future. However, in a world of big data, we need to have a defence against drawing strong conclusions from weak data. Enter the chi-squared test, as recommended by the Royal Statistical Society, to help us spot the signal from the noise. It's really not something you need to study, but I put a link to a Wikipedia page in the notes, should you wish to look into it. Let's do our first statistical test. Here's the same actual birth data in blue, but plotted as dots rather than columns. I fitted a red trend line to the data, which suggests, as we can see by eye, the data is pretty constant from year to year. But let's do a formal check that the data is not increasing. I'm going to test the hypothesis that the expected number of births each month is constant over time. So I set the expected births each month to the average value, which is circa 250, and the actual data scores 41% on the chi-squared test. Now, what does a 41% test result mean? Well, 100% would mean that the actual equals the expected exactly, i.e. perfectly flat in this example. A score of 41% means it's an okay comparison, but not perfect. And a score of 5% or less would mean that statistically, we have not been able to prove our hypothesis probably because the data is highly volatile and indeed likely showing a trend up or down. But that's not the case here, so let's move on. 
Let's change our hypothesis so that the expected number of births for each calendar month is constant, i.e. we think there's seasonality in our data, with more babies born at certain times of year. Of course, some months are longer, and more babies are born nine months after the period of time when daylight hours are less. So it's a fair hypothesis. Boom, our chi-squared test result goes up to 79%. Now, although this is a higher value, it doesn't prove that seasonality exists as the actual data passed the previous test, which had no seasonality. However, it's good to have a reason for correlation, since just spotting a correlation between two sets of data does not imply that one set of data has caused the other. There are many websites which poke fun at mistaking correlation with causation, with my favourite being the strong correlation between the months of high stalk migration and the months of high births in the US. Note that you'll see how we changed our mind after seeing the results, and this really isn't the scientific approach. For that, we would decide on the questions we want to answer, and then go out and capture unbiased, relevant data to test our hypotheses with. This is set out in the Royal Statistical Society paper, and it's important as it's dangerous to try to back-derive your hypotheses from your results. It's also worth noting that while there are mathematical facts, 2 plus 2 equals 4, for example, it's virtually impossible to know anything statistically. If anyone tells you with absolute confidence that they prove something statistically, and they probably don't know what they're talking about. This is why physical evidence in medical cases is so important. There are numerous cases from overseas where unsafe convictions based purely on statistics have been overturned and innocent people free, unfortunately with their lives and reputations in tatters. Now imagine I spotted a medical competency issue in some data. It would be entirely the wrong move for me to rush out and start performing operations myself. It's clear that I would not be qualified to pursue this despite spotting the issue. Similarly, medical professionals should stay well away from making dangerous statistical inferences that they are unqualified to do. The same would apply to the police, journalists, barristers and judges. This particularly applies to prosecution barristers who have unlimited funds at their disposal to seek the right support to understand and communicate statistical information fairly. Anyway, going back to the data. We don't think there's been growth in babies born at the Countess of Chester over time or any unexpectedly odd periods of births there either. Now, let's look at the data on baby deaths. Now, obviously, every single baby dying is a tragedy, and I have no idea how parents ever get over it, or how nurses and doctors even manage to function with such tragedies happening regularly around them. So, I appreciate this is a sensitive topic, but we do need to look into the data to see if there's anything statistically concerning. This data shows all baby deaths, and it should be noted that this includes late pregnancy losses and stillbirths, as well as neonatal deaths. We can see that monthly these figures range from 0 to 5, even in the pre let period, which sounds horrendous, but there are hundreds of babies being born in the hospital each month, and the implied mortality rate is about 1 in 200. Converting our columns into dots and fitting a trend line, we can see a strong downward trend over time. The hypothesis of a constant monthly amount of deaths fails the chi-squared test with just a 3% value. What's going on? Well, there's a key assumption in our test, and that relates to each month presenting a similar risk. We haven't actually proved that monthly births are irregular, since we haven't allowed for the neonatal unit being downgraded from level 2 to level 1 in 2017. This means it was restricted to low-risk cases and only provided care to babies born after 32 weeks, as opposed to the 27-week gestation period allowed for babies cared for at level 2. This is clearly a massive change in risk, so we need to rethink our hypothesis. Just before I do that, remember, it's always important to consider risk levels when you look at data over time, particularly sensitive medical data. Now, we could discard data from 27 onwards, but let's also throw away data in August to December 2016 to align a little more to the dates when Lucy Letby was working on the unit. Now, our trend line is flat over this period, and our hypothesis of constant deaths is not disproved with a 12% chi-squared test result. So, although there are some high points in the May 2015, July 2016 period, it's not statistically significant in our test. But wait, Letby only worked on the neonatal ward. So let's remove the poor parents who suffered stillbirths and late fetal losses. Here's the whole data set for neonatal deaths only. Again a decreasing trend line, but just scraping past the chi-squared test with 6%. Remove the August 2016 and post data, and we see a few interesting things. Firstly, there are some high monthly numbers in the let be period. Prior to this, we had monthly maximums of two, and now we've got some treble tragedies. There is also an increasing red trend line. But our hypothesis that constant monthly deaths is not disproved, with an 18% chi-squared result. So, across the whole Freedom of Information data, we haven't managed to statistically prove anything. Let's drop this data and move on to the public MBR Race UK reports. 
First up, what they call a crude neonatal mortality rate. We can see a more than doubling in 2015 compared to 2014 before falling back again in 2017. The 2016 report does not publish a crude mortality rate for the Countess of Chester Hospital, which is annoying, but quite common for all hospitals. That 2015 data is the saber-toothed tiger moment for the hard-working medical professionals at the Countess of Chester Hospital. And quite rightly so, they are caring for the most vulnerable members of our society, so we want them to be hyper-vigilant and call out every tiny issue they can so we and they can hone care and save every last baby possible. We all make these kind of instinctive reactions in our daily lives. If my daughter gives me one kiss on the cheek, it means she loves me. If she does it thrice, I know she's about to ask for some money. But remember, these are doctors and nurses who aren't trained in statistical analysis, who suffer from and aren't trained against those hyper-trend spotting tendencies we all have. So they correctly raise the alarm and then await the statistical and medical experts to come and tell them if there's really a problem and for the physical evidence to be gathered to demonstrate wrongdoing. We can do a quick check here to ensure our two data sources are consistent. We take our neonatal deaths from the Freedom of Information request and can back derive the births in the MBR race study. We get 3,000 per year, which is strongly consistent with the 250 births per month we saw before. But this itself is interesting. The neonatal mortality rate is purely based on each baby born in that hospital. It doesn't reflect whether each birth is high or low risk. It doesn't reflect transfers in or out of the hospital due to risk. So you can see how different hospitals could get different mortality rates. For example, if they are known centers of excellence for high-risk newborns, then they will get transfers in, causing their neonatal mortality rates to increase, both due to more babies in care and those babies being higher risk. Crude mortality rates can only get us so far. We know not every baby presents the same risk of death, with factors like gestation period and age of mother leading to wildly different survival prospects. Fortunately, the MBR race report calculates what they call a stabilised mortality rate for each hospital. This is calculated by adjusting actual mortality by baby for the risk factors for that baby. These risks relate to both the baby and the mother. The analysis, however, doesn't allow for hospital-specific risk factors, such as staffing levels, staff expertise or cleanliness. This is understandable, given the MBR race analysis covers every hospital in the country, and such data would have been enormously expensive to capture and verify. However, it does mean that comparisons between hospitals can be confounded by these environmental factors, and the report even notes that they do appear to have a bias in their analysis, with hospitals in the north of England, such as the Countess of Chester, generally scoring worse than others. There is actually a real eye-opening key risk, which is covered in the MBR race report, and is extremely pertinent to the Letby case, which, from what I can see, has never been mentioned by the prosecution or the defence in the case, and which I'll cover in a future video. Looking at this angle on the data, we can see how the 2015 mortality, when stabilised for risk factors, is much closer to 2014 now, and only one and a half times higher compared to 2.25 before. One or two kisses from my daughter and I think my wallet is safe for the day. So there's a big reduction from crude to stabilised mortality in 2015, which we can't see in 2014 or 2017. Given we know actual mortality was high in 2016 too, we can also imply a similarly big reduction in 2016. This is strong evidence that the Countess of Chester was taking on much higher risk babies than average in 2015 and 2016 too. This is rather important information, which doesn't appear anywhere in the public court judgments and statements I've seen. However, mortality at the hospital was still high in 2015 and actual babies were dying. The MBRA study gives a benchmark by comparing to similar hospitals, i.e. those with two to 4,000 births a year. Remember, the Countess of Chester had about 3,000 a year. We can see that the benchmark orange blobs slowly fall from 2014 to 2017, which is excellent news, going from 1.3 to 1. However, the Countess of Chester does look to have bad experience still. In 2015 and 2016, blue blobs much higher than the orange. It's interesting to note that the MBRA study doesn't compare hospitals on crude mortality, as they know you have to standardise for risk to draw any meaningful comparisons. They also put in confidence interval around stabilised mortality for the same reason. They are worried that people will jump on any outliers and fly to the wrong conclusions. They know people are still worried about those sabre-toothed tigers. Now, we know the actual deaths from the Freedom of Information request, so we can turn these mortality rates into actual numbers of neonatal deaths. So, we have 17 neonatal deaths across 2015 and 2016, whereas the benchmark would have implied 11 to 12 deaths. This is our 1.5 ratio again. 
Interesting to note that with five and a half excess deaths, we have a legal conclusion that a serial killer was taking out seven babies and trying to murder many more in this period. Given we have actual numbers now rather than mortality rates, we can test another hypothesis. Let's go for neonatal deaths being constant from year to year, giving us a chi-squared test result of 48%. So again, we cannot prove that actual numbers of deaths displayed an odd pattern across 2014 to 2017 compared to expected. Let's cut out 2014 and 2017, which look very normal and repeat the test. Now we get a 12% chi-squared test result, which is a lot worse, but still not breaking the 5% threshold. So again, we cannot prove that the actual numbers of deaths displayed were out of the normal volatility expected in small numbers. There's one more way we can extract value from the MBR race study. The authors admit that calculating stabilized mortality rates is uncertain, and so they give a 95% confidence interval on the estimated stabilized mortality rates for each hospital. If we plot these low and high boundaries for the stabilized mortality rate, we can clearly see that the comparator group stabilized mortality rates are well within this alternative 95th confidence interval. So again, we cannot prove that the actual mortality rates are out of the normal range expected. So going back to the key points from the Royal Statistical Society paper, what can we use statistics to prove about the Countess of Chester's neonatal data? Well, we can't prove anything looks out of the ordinary. There has always been, and there always will be, volatility in small numbers. And with an expected number of neonatal deaths being just a handful per year, it's not surprising at all to see yearly summations doubling from year to year. The signals seen are no more indicative than tossing several heads in a row is to proving a double-headed coin. This probably goes to explain why so many statistical experts have been openly expressing their concerns about this case. In a future video, we'll consider how you should fairly investigate a quirk in observed deaths like the one seen at the Countess of Chester in 2016 and 2017. On the basis of the limited statistical evidence, you would expect there to be compelling physical evidence against Lucy Letby. But is there? Not that I can see in the judge's sentencing remarks. Not that I can see in the appeal court judgment. Maybe it's in the trial notes, but these have not been made publicly available yet. If you have a copy, get in touch, and I'll see what I can do to analyse any relevant and detailed data you can provide. Thanks for listening. This has been a Justice by Numbers production. Please like and subscribe to support new videos on this channel. All sources of information are listed in the notes.